incredible, do you understand? Yeah. I'm serious. You think I could have done that without you standing next to me being strong? Are you feeling this? Are you feeling the I'm feeling right now? Yeah, I'm cold. You're cold? Yeah. Let's get to Virginia, man. Just keep your head now. Turn around. He's all right. We didn't do anything. Whoa, whoa, Get back here. So I told you about my brother, yeah? Something happened. I don't know exactly what. He's been arrested. He's being held at Rikers Island. Oh. oh my God, that's awful. Make me clean. Just gotta get him out of there before something bad happens. He could get killed in there. The pure from love. Damned always at it. You need another 10 grand. You get another 10 grand, your brother will get out. The truth is an act of love. I think something very important is happening and it's deeply connected to my purpose. Every day I think about untwisting and untangling these strings I'm in and to lead a pure life. I look ahead in a clear sky. I ain't gonna get there. It's a nice dream. It's a nice dream. Please welcome uh, the filmmakers and the cast of Good Time, Robert Pattinson, Jennifer Jason Lee, Buddy Duress, Talia Webster, and the brothers themselves, Benny and Josh Safty. Guys, thanks so much for being here. Give them another round of applause. This is... Without a doubt, this is uh, my favorite movie of the year. Uh, this is the kind of movie that if I saw this when I was 15, it'd make me want to go make movies. It's, it's unbelievable. It's an act of love. It's brutal. It's funny. And it takes everything great about filmmaking and just jams it into one movie. Congratulations, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, let's talk about how all of this started. Something about you seeing an advertisement and deciding that that advertisement was how you should make movies? What happened? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I saw. Oh, am I on? Um, I, I see. I, I saw this photograph from um, that previous movie, Heaven Knows What, and I just knew. I saw. I, saw, I found them. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't really. No, I really liked. Uh, I just liked the energy it had, and I liked the fact that they were American filmmakers. And um, and then I, I saw their previous movie, and I just I love the energy which they can capture. They're uh, they're, they're kind of they can create this kind of out of control, wild feeling, which I don't think a lot of people can. Your films have always, I mean, going back to, I think, Daddy Long Legs and with uh, Heaven Knows What, people who are on the edge, whether it's economically or just sort of emotionally on the edge, there's something that's just a little crooked about their energy in relation to the rest of the world. How did you bring that to what is, uh, I think a lot of people have referred this to as like a pulp noir film. How did yeah. you How did you bring that to it? Well, it's, it's uh it's funny you say when you if you imagine seeing this at your when you're 15 that was kind of our original intent was like let's make a movie that our 16 year old 17 year old the poster like. would be on my wall like, <laughs> well, that's, no no doubt the poster for this, this one? would be on my wall I'm not sure which one but yeah. one of them would be. <laughs> whatever one the video store I was working at in when I was 15 let go of at the end sure. of sure you know it, it has a real um, uh, tape head quality to it like this thing that you that you feel a sense of ownership over because you know the audience we're not spoon feeding anything to the audience so the audience can kind of engage with it in a way uh, in terms of like edges I, I can't speak to that really I um, I think this movie's about a winner who never wins and and uh, you know somebody who is heroic as despicable as some of the things he does I still find him to be heroic and it forces you to ask yourself what would I do in those scenarios would I what, what lengths would I go to to kind of, tr you know, be heroic in a way? I think, the, the, yeah, the emotional aspect of it is, is really, like, spot on just in the sense of there is a logic to, to Connie and there's a logic to the other characters we have, but it might be a flawed logic. But the very fact that you can follow that path, it allows you to kind of discover more about that person or yourself or society in general. You oddly sympathize him with him throughout the entire movie, no matter where he takes you. And I'm wondering if that's just if that's something that you guys discovered could work if you just gave him a path and a journey and, and an objective. Like you could create 
whatever kind of monster, and he's not necessarily a monster, but whatever kind of monster you wanted as long as they had an object, clear objective for the audience to follow. Sure. I mean, we, we wanted, we wanted the, the sense of like a, a pulp thriller that actually felt thrilling. And the only way to kind of tap into that was kind of jumping into Connie's head in, in his regard. And, and him, in a weird way, he's kind of a, a, he can purvey and see society for kind of really what it is, having been in jail, having, you know, been blacklisted from his own family. These are things that went into the backstory. So you got that wonderful line about cops while he's watching cops, yeah, right? Yeah, with, I mean, when we were making, when we were writing, them, before we started writing the movie, I downloaded every episode of Cops, like <laughs> every single one. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's tw 25 seasons. There's like, you know, there's a lot of episodes. Uh, a lot of counties out there who want to be filmed beating people up. Well, totally, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's it, but just like you look at the the two the two guys who broke out of prison upstate. You know, when that happened, you kind of saw every not everybody, but a lot of people rooting for these people. He's talking like, about Richard. Madden, yeah, the Richard Madden, David Sweat from yeah. upstate. And so all of a so sudden, you you're just like, about what he's really known for. Yeah. Sorry. But yeah, exactly. Well, he's really known for being a murderer, and like they're 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 bad guys. And so you're just, but you kind of step back and you're caught up in the moment, like, oh my God, they're a mile from the border. Get there, get there. It's like you, you're rooting like Cool Hand Luke, but then you step away from it when they get caught and they run down what they've actually done. And you're like, oh my God, wow. We've always thinking? sensationalized as a culture. We've always sensationalized crime. You know, Bonnie and Clyde really exposed that to the country that like this movie came out and everyone loved it. It was a huge hit. But really, ultimately, you're talking about people who go around killing other people and like, you know what? I mean, we went through great lengths to not have any guns in our movie. I, I also think that one of the things that you do is you, while creating a pulpy thriller, you don't in any way, and glorify isn't the right word, but make it so that Connie is sort of s too smart and too clever and too shiny and on top of everything. He's not a polished criminal. I think we're, you know, that's you talk about these two guys, these two escapees, these convicts. They made mistakes along the way, and they were constantly screwing up. And it's very similar for Connie. Like you, you follow him, but he is screwing up all the time. He's not necessarily on top of his own journey. Yeah, he's just he's improvising. Yeah, and he's a, he's a kind of minorly skilled improviser. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all, I think it's also he has. Uh, uh, it may be just because he has a very specific goal in mind and and a lot of drive, but. Uh, he, he's not acting out of fear. Um, and so if you eliminate fear and hesitation and also he's not thinking about conventional circumstance, uh, conventional um, consequence of, uh, of his actions. And so it's kind of, it's much easier to make quick decisions if you're not thinking, oh, well, if I did this, and he's, he's not really planning anything. So it kind of seems like if, you're, if you just act very, very, very quickly, it kind of seems like you're more intelligent than you are for a second. I'm curious, you know, uh, a lot has been said or in interviews you guys have talked about taking you around to some detention facilities and, and, and having you meet people. I mean, I think as Connie, you were meeting people, but how did those experiences affect your performance? Was it something that was tangible or something that you ended up just kind of feeling and it came out in its own way? Uh, yeah, I mean, everything kind of, it was I had a long time talking to these guys and meeting a lot of people who've been in our prison and uh, and just people who live who live in the kind of area the kind of uh, it just seemed seemed like Connie to me um, and uh, I think one of the most interesting was when I was talking to buddy and he knew this guy who had was a young bank robber and I was like I was asking buddy I was like you know what's the motivation behind it blah, blah, blah. But he's like, well, he just wanted money. <laughs> and I was literally, and I, however simple it is, I was literally just like, that's kind of, <laughs> obviously immediately romanticizing. Like, it's profound. That. <laughs> <laughs> Doing this thing. And I was like, that really was one of the things where it's kind of. There's no next step. There's no next step. And, it's, and if really, it, it's a talent in itself to not, to eliminate that next step. Because a human, you know, you can't help but think of the next step or something. And if you can somehow not think about that, then it's like, in a lot of ways, it's like, uh, a kind of zen kind of existence. Um, but yeah, that was, I remember when he said that, that was kind of, that was a trigger. And buddy, you have what I think is gonna be a kind of classic, an iconic sequence in this movie that's gonna live on for quite some time. Uh, yeah. You started working with these guys on Heaven Knows What, you're coming to this. Uh, you're not necessarily a trained actor, right? This is sort of a, a, new, a new thing for you in your life. How does it feel to have a second movie where you're, I mean, in many ways, you have scenes where you are the, the shining star of this movie. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, I mean, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I went to I went to an acting class for a little while, but besides that, I really haven't had much experience. Besides these, this is my third movie now. This person to person, and heaven knows what. You were wonderful in person to person, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, what's the question? <laughs> What's it like for you to keep up with acting and, and, and to have more and more challenges? Obviously, these guys, at least, are sort of challenging you more with each film that they make with you. He did that whole, by the way, just so you know, that whole monologue in one take. Without anybody so in the know. car. Yeah. So it was just like uh, you look over and Buddy was just in this mode of just, like, talking and gesticulating to nobody. And I didn't mean to like cut you off, of Buddy. I just had to, because I know you won't say that, but I can. It's an incredible monologue. Thank you, thank you. No, I mean... <clears throat> I love acting. I can't wait to do another role. Um, and uh, I mean, good time. Good time was crazy. I mean, I had a, I had I had such a good time work, working on it. You know, I can't say I can't even say that phrase now without it being like a pun. You know, <laughs> but it was great. Like, I mean, I don't even know what to say. I mean. You know, thank you, Josh. Thank you, you guys, you and Benny. You guys really helped me. Like, I don't know where I'd be right now if it, if it wasn't for you, you and Benny. You know, when I met you, and you, thank you, you let me be in heaven knows what. Yeah. I, I'd be, I don't know where I'd be right now. Like seriously, I definitely wouldn't be here. You know, <laughs> doing promotion for a movie. Yeah. yeah. Jennifer, you are uh, one of my favorite actresses, one of the, the great actresses, I think, and uh, totally robbed for the hateful. I think you should have won every award on the book. 100%. For that movie. Yeah. Uh, as awkward as a, as a thing that probably is to say to your face, sorry. Uh, what made you want to work with the Safety Brothers? It's a wonderful performance, a really weird character. Uh, I, I loved her as soon as I di uh, discovered what she was. I, I was so excited to watch her flail. <laughs> Um, I, I was really excited to, to work with them. I, I loved their movies, and um, we have a mutual friend, Owen Klein, and so they sent me, like, even though she's only in the movie, like, a really just a tiny amount, like, the backstory was so complicated and beautifully written and detailed, like, down to, like, meeting in the drugstore, you know? <laughs> Brilliant. So you came in with so much information, and it was so... And just their filmmaking is so alive, you know? When I was 14, I saw Dog Day Afternoon, and that was the movie that changed my life. And I do feel like watching that this film, it has that same sort of energy where it just feels so visceral, and you don't know what's going to happen from moment to moment. Like, anything could happen, and things happen where you're just like, holy... Yeah, like you're just stunned and shocked that it's going there. And I really didn't know. I just knew my part, which is also a really fun... <laughs> I mean, it's like a free fall in a certain way, but, you know, they're so good, and it's just... And we, like, met on... And suddenly we we're in this relationship. <laughs> but it was so easy. Like, Rob, I'm still not used to your English accent. Like, I, I, I just can't. <laughs> I, it was so, it was so, I was all kind of effortless and really fun. And I just think the movie's brilliant. I think she oh, brings man. up a good point, which is that you gave her this massive backstory. And we, I briefly mentioned Jonathan Demi backstage when we were talking. And one of the things that he always said was, whoever is on camera is the star of the movie in that given moment. And everybody that appears in this movie feels like they have a backstory. Going, going with Talia's character, who feels like she has this amazing backstory and her grandmother has some, she becomes a weird character for the moments that she's on. Can you talk about doing that? Because obviously when you're trying to drive plot forward, you're finding people that are going to engage with the plot. At what point do you start sort of expanding those characters and knowing how much to expand them and how they'll fit into the film. I mean, you have to do that first, and then you can write the, the, the scenarios. You can't know what your character's going to do unless you know the characters, in a way. And, yeah. and uh, with Talia, you know, we... we uh, it was interesting is that her... We wrote this character, and then we did this, basically, citywide search. Street casting went to every borough. We did an open casting call. 600 people showed up, and Talia was one, one of them. And in her interview, she kind of 
was telling these stories, you know, she didn't know anything about the movie. Uh, and they were lining up with some of the character background that we had already written for Crystal, except her whole attitude is a little different than Crystal, so she played her a different way. But, uh, you know, I think that that was, sometimes you have these serendipitous moments where you, where you kind of wish it, will it to the world and these things kind of come to you. And, and uh, I do believe in the sudden star, and I think that, you know, a star is way well beyond the people on the cover of tabloid magazines, that they're, you know, people you can meet every day, and it's a gravitational pull, and that's, our casting department ser seriously understands that, you know, and, and, you know, it's an honor, honestly, to work with, you know, first-timers and, and uh, very established actors who still somehow maintain that kind of luminosity and that uh, kind of gravitational pull of, like, it's almost their first time, and that's, like, I bow down, you know, like Barkat Abdi is not here as well, I mean, he, I don't know, so I, I'm, I, we are, you know, someone once asked us, who's in control, the director or the actor? And, you know, a bunch of people in the, in the room raised their hand for the director, and someone said the actor, and then I, d I didn't raise my hand for either, because I wasn't sure. And ultimately, I think the actor is in control, because, you know, they, it's their soul, so I don't know. <laughs> With Talia, it was just interesting, because we think the world kind of willed, willed itself, but I think you kind of willed yourself on the world to get this part, you know? You're amazing in the, in the film. You have a, uh, an expression on your face throughout all of your scenes that is just wise beyond the years of that character. <laughs> and then also just sort of taking in everything. And I mean, everything that's going on in her head is, is red on your face. It's really, really beautiful. Can you talk about having your first movie, your first scenes be with, sorry, Rob, a, a major star like Robert Pattinson? Um. <laughs> was it weird? Um, like, it was kind of shocking. Like, I didn't know who I was coming into the film with whatsoever. So it's like when you first meet everybody, it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just bring out the professional person. Let's see how this is going to go. But it was like working with Rob, it was just great because, like, I've watched every single Twilight back to forward like i have the posters the the team the the team werewolf and team vampire like i was just like it's just rob like oh my gosh like how do, can i this be my first thing and i'm working with rob but i mean it was great to have that experience so none of us had any idea that that existed yeah when we when we did the rehearsal she acted like she could give two like Two, sh swear, two, okay. two shits about Rob. It was like she, had, she was listening to music in one ear and like looking at her phone, like, okay, yeah, that's cool, and just moving. She was on. texting friends on yeah. her phone. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. No, 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 no. He was intimidated by you. Yeah. Whoa. Yes. Yeah, I'm intimidated by everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, th this is uh, you're you're rightfully getting a lot of accolades for for your performance in this film. You carry the movie. It's it's a really unbelievable performance. Talk about how you found Connie and held on to him for the duration of the of the shoot. What was your, for lack of a better word, process like? Um, I mean, I think it's a lot easier to commit to something when you, like, I, I just knew, I knew initially just the energy, that, and I, I'd seen their work, and just, I knew I really wanted to commit to something which felt out of control, just, um, because I just wanted to be, I wanted, to, you know, it's it, it's like you know, it's just like jumping in the in, in the deep end. Like it's it's the easiest way to kind of force yourself to do something, but I also wanted to jump in the deep end and some and some rapids <laughs> as well, and kind of hopefully, you know, it just forces you to to get over certain things, um, inhibitions and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I thought uh, it was just so well written at the beginning, and it, and it kind of. And it was just so surprising. And it, it, whenever you read something which you want to you want to say out loud immediately, it's just you know that there's something there. And uh, you were kind of part of the of the writing process, right? Or at least sort of there for the development of, of the story. I mean, like not. I mean, obviously, like Josh and Josh and Ronnie were just like, like I was in Colombia when they were doing it, but uh, but they were very open about sending just a, a section. And then I would, I would be <laughs> sending Josh like really metaphysical uh, text messages. I was very. I think one of our first conversations it was about. Uh, we just describing Connie going. Like, he's a superhero. He's a super. This was how we should have promoted the whole movie. And we're just like it's a superhero movie. <laughs> That's exactly if you like. Pitched it to movie. Marvel. That's it, yeah. <laughs> superhero can only see thirty seconds into the future. Do we know yeah. what Connie's superhero name would be? 
Connie. Oh, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Super Con. The, the, the uh, biggest power he has. Con Super Con is kind of man. amazing, yeah. actually. The, the biggest power he has is that he has, he, he has the ability to not recognize his past, in the, even to a second before, you know? <laughs> it's like, I wish that sometimes I had that ability. Uh, Benny, you have a, outside of co-directing the film, you have a really hard role to play in the film. You play Connie's brother, who's um, developmentally disabled, an a, a adult that's developmentally disabled. Uh, talk about crafting that performance and do, giving it as much respect as you, as you possibly can while at the same time having to sort of perform those effects. Yeah, um, it was, that was, in, I guess in the writing process, Ron, well, b ten years like in 2010, Ronnie and I were working on a, a character, and we were he he asked me to kind of mine my own self f to create something, and I looked at my own sort of emotional deficiencies or places where I thought maybe I could have gone if this didn't happen, and I developed this way of talking, and we just worked on this character, and we did a bunch of rehearsals, and created this in insane backstory for him. And then the movie never ended up happening, but we had this, this guy, who Jordan was his name, who just was created, but then never had anywhere else to go outside of this. And then he spoke to Josh, and he's like, let's bring this character to this story. And originally I wasn't gonna play him, but when it was, when we finally decided, okay, I'm gonna do this, it was just a matter of, okay, now let's update him to now, you know, he's 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 bigger, he's stronger. So that let's let's add that into the equation. So maybe somebody might be able to take advantage of him intellectually, but physically, there's there's something to be there. There's something that you have to reckon with, and that he's aware of that. But just playing the part, just kind of trying to understand where I was and where Nick was. I never wanted to be. I never wanted to be aware of what Nick couldn't feel. You know, because Nick doesn't know that he can't feel those things. So he can only feel a vague sensation of a certain emotion, whereas I would be aware of that, and I, but I would never bring that down to Nick because I didn't want to act down to him. I just wanted to be him, and I don't know. And when Rob and I did a lot of, because once, I once I was gonna play the part, we were able to kind of build a lot of just character, you know, brotherness outside of the, the, the film just to create a bond between each other. It's so. also interesting, I mean, I just realized as well, because um, Benny was so familiar with the part, we went in to do, when we started doing these improvisations and stuff, it's strange to have known you as Benny I and mean, then he could just turn on this part and he could turn it on a long time before I really knew what I was doing with Connie, and so you kind. Of, but it was kind of good. I mean, a lot of uh, one of the things I really wanted to stress as well when, when the script was being developed is like it's like they are, they're estranged. I mean, he hasn't seen him for a long time until fairly recently, and it's just someone who comes into your, you just come into someone's life and you just say like, like you're my brother, you're my blood, I love you. But he has absolutely no idea who he is, and it's like he hasn't seen him from like, especially someone who's developmentally. Uh, disabled, um, or not disabled, like develop, has like learning difficulties. Yeah. I mean, like it's difficult to have, you know, to to say I'm basically going to be a carer or whatever. And Connie is not thinking about that at all. He's just thinking. I mean, he he just commits. Yeah, he commits. He refuses to accept that there's even anything wrong with him. I mean, that's like why. Like, I mean, it's one of the early lines. He's like, he's almost disgusted by like he thinks his brother, <laughs> even though there's no sign of Nick. Acknowledging, like, going, like, oh, I need help or anything. It's like, he's, but like, he's, he's, he, Connie expects Nick to say, it's like, oh, yeah, sorry, I'll pull my socks up and just, I'll get over it now. Sorry, I was just messing around. Like, uh, but yeah, I think Connie really, he just is incapable of understanding that, like, that's, uh, that, you know, he may actually need help from somebody else. Before we uh, move to audience questions, there's a couple other characters in this film or that are a part of this film, which is the music is really unbelievable. It's uh, in, in a lot of ways, I don't want to say a throwback, but it reminded me a lot of like Tangerine Dream and the Sorcerer soundtrack. And you turn to uh, this musician, Daniel LaPatton, who is- One of uh, Tricks Point Never. Yeah. I, I, I've known him forever and I can't say the band. No, yeah, yeah Iggy Pop, when he was reached out to, to him, but he's, he's like, I'm not gonna even attempt to say that name. I don't, I, I, when, but that was interesting. That in when I first discovered One of Tricks Point Never, I. It was it kind of existed outside of language in that in an interesting OPN. way. It just became OPN. Yeah, you uh, Ani Otri No one could say it. No, he's been. It was interesting. We met him. Uh, I'm happy we met him at the stage that we did because I had been a fan of his music as music. But it was always to me. They always felt like uh, 
soundtracks to movies that didn't exist. I, I don't even know how he feels about that term. But he, he was actually one of the, he was like the third piece attached to the movie. It was, it was Buddy, Rob, and, and Daniel, and 10 Trick. So he was very, he you know, read the script, he was looking at all these pictures, he was looking at inspirations, movies, and then we would just sit and, and do these sessions where we just played music for one another. And yeah, the, a lot of prog music, but electronic music was a, we wanted this thing, this, this, we agreed that the score would be this fever inside the movie that constantly wants to break, because ultimately the movie's about breaking free. So he's, it's, you know, we would do these things, um, these arpeggios, these beat-based tracks, basically, for the movie, and then I would say, all right, I'm gonna go get his food, uh, put your soul into a solo, and he'd be like, okay. And then I'd come back, and he would have this in incredible solo and the movie does the score has these moments where it just kind of breaks yeah, into he, solo and that's really he, he said something interesting like kind because of, um the tangerine dream comparison he always gets he's like what but he pointed something out where he's like yeah there's with the tangerine dream scores you kind of have this mood that exists and it just creates and it's beautiful but here there's always like like josh was saying there are these yeah. moments of solo where the music is becoming another like voice almost where it's like shredding of some some sort and it's almost a musical at times, but it's, it, it, it fits, it's completely woven in with the fabric. And well, then you have, at the end, obviously, there's this propulsive electronic score that's making this yeah. movie even more thrilling than it even, maybe even needs to be. It's a hyper thriller. Uh, and then it kind of breaks, and you're kind of reminded as an audience, like, we've been following this character's mindset, and he's so stuck in the moment, like we all are in life. We all get so stuck in the moment that we forget about the things maybe that actually matter, and then you're kind of, like, left with, you know, with, 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 switches. The, with, with, the, yeah. with the developmentally disabled, the handicap, you know, totally forgotten about, you know, and like you're kind of reminded like, oh my God, we all get wrapped up in this thing and then we ditch the electronic score and we come in with a very kind of, you know, emotional piece that Daniel wrote that we sent to Iggy Pop and Iggy Pop's like, I saw the movie and I have a response to it and these are my lyrics and I have some spoken word stuff. We had no idea what he wrote and then he kind of comes in as this kind of like, omniscient narrator of the film because he saw the movie from both Connie's point of view and Nick's point of view, but he saw the purity in, in, all, in it all. And like, yeah, his lyrics, you know, he really blessed the movie with that final track. I think the way that you put it that it's kind of trying to break out is how it perfectly complements the film. The cinematography always feels like people are trying to break out of the frame and that it itself is kind of grainy and breaking at times, which is I think something that we've seen in your in your films before. It's sort of what you're attracted to. And there, it, the way that he does the score, it always feels like it's crackling the speaker just a little bit, you know, like something is breaking. Before I turn to the audience, last thing, when Iggy Pop sent you the track and the lyrics, did you cry? I would well, I would hold my eyes out. I did cry Biggie in the Pop studio. Wrote a song for yeah. something we like recorded it a few blocks from here, actually, and I had no idea. We had no idea what he was gonna write. I was like really nervous because he was such an like a, a god to me. You know, I actually told him that he pulled me up on stage when I was 17 once and like let me, you know, whatever dance on stage in, in Randall's Island. But he, he, um, I was worried because I was like, what do I do if I don't like what Iggy <laughs> wrote? But then I was, I was on my way to the, to the studio, and I was like, of course I'm gonna like it. So, so I was waiting, we were waiting and waiting, waiting, and we never actually, I still haven't even met the guy, I've only done these virtual sessions with him, and we're just waiting in this studio, and then all of a sudden, he just started speaking on this insane sound system, like, hey guys, I'm here. And he said, I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time with the music, Daniel, I have some stuff that I uh, wrote that I wanna sing, and then I have a bunch of spoken word bits. And that immediately, conceptually, we were like, what? What do you mean spoken word bits? And, and yeah, we just listened to him basically give the most incredible review of this movie of well, all time. And I did cry. We yeah. all cried. There was Daniel was crying. Sebastian Bear McLeod, the producer. We were all crying. I just it was weird. I, I, couldn't, you know. I couldn't believe that he was able to... Because like for just so he was able to tap into to Nick's point of view, and that's kind of the last like things that you hear, just... The fact this this idea of petting the crocodiles that it sounds so beautiful but it's so dangerous, and it was such a beautiful poetic way of putting it. And he, we later spoke to him and he said it was these kids that he knew in in Detroit. He asked them what they were doing and uh, he was like they and they were just kind of like w talking about how eventually they would go to paradise and be able to pet the crocodiles. And it was so such a strange term, but leave he a trailer park. Yeah, it's, their afterlife would but be where they get to pet the crocodiles. It's crocodile. like yeah, to crocodile. pet crocodiles is such. I a mean, strange Buddy texts thing. me often the spoken word bits that's actually in the trailer. And he just, go, he just goes, tell me a more powerful lyric. Just yeah. tell me. Yeah. <laughs> I would agree. I, 
I, I audibly gasped when I heard Pet the Crocodiles yeah. in the theater. Uh, I got to turn it over to these guys. Uh, who's got a question out here? Hi. Uh, uh, first question is going to be from Facebook. Um, Rose Equival would like to know, uh, because the main character never stops plotting, manipulating, and moving, he's in constant motion. Was that dif difficult to portray? How did you get into that mindset? Um, no, I think it's kind of, uh, there's definitely, I mean, something to do with the, uh, the, these guys' style, but also uh, Sean Price Williams, who shot it. Like, uh, I wanted to do something which was very much about physicality and being able to move and you know normally if you're shooting something which you, a, a, a director of photography is just trying to capture your what's happening on your face or if it's a very kind of static camera you feel like you have to squeeze the performance into the camera whereas with Sean the amount of time it took me a little while to get used to it but like when you're in fairly significant scenes and then you turn around and Sean's like what are you shooting you're like like kind of on like a fridge door or something but once you uh once you realize that he's definitely, he's operating as part of, um, uh, that he's, he's, he's active in the world. And so it, it actually makes it a lot easier to be able to, to fully incorporate the world into your performance as well. Um, I think it's a lot easier. And you direct with an earpiece, right? Yeah, the cameraman has an earwig, has an earpiece, so I can talk to him at all times. Yeah, they're, they're, and also there's, we, we, we dress it and light it for 360. So yeah. everybody can go anywhere and, Hopefully, there's this feeling that you can you can make a mistake and. Are you at the monitors, kind of like I'm, okay, like go here and try to. I yeah, I'm, I because I can most of the time I can see also obviously the the actual set, uh, but yeah, he was I'd say ninety percent of the movie he had music playing in one ear, and then or sometimes the scene dialogue, and then me in his other ear, and I would just sit there and like you know tell him like hands hands eyes you know and and. Uh, or turn around, something's happening behind you. He cut his t he cut his teeth with uh, uh, Albert Mazels, the late great doc, one of the greatest American documentarians. So he he's very aware always of his surroundings when he's shooting as well. And he loves shooting on film, and this was 35 millimeter. So everything was like this romantic dream for him. And he's an unbelievable operator. I think we have time for one more question because I hogged all the time. I, I, I don't. I'll take credit too. I talk too much. <laughs> Hi guys, thanks for being here. Um, I'm excited to see the film. So for all the actors, I'm curious, which of your previous roles that you've done helped you prepare for the one in this one? Buddy? Ha heaven knows what definitely <laughs> probably helped me prepare for this one. I'm um, thinking about, uh, yeah, probably definitely that movie. Jennifer, what about you? You have so many iconic characters that, that you've played. That's a really hard question because I feel like this role is so sort of different from anyone I've ever played. So I, she just is her own creature, I think. <laughs> and I, it really came from you guys. I don't, I, I really just kind of don't even know what I was doing. I mean, but you, you, were, you were saying certain lines where I was like, oh my God, this is insane. What, like like the, the chip, the card, like, oh yeah. yeah. Like the bane of my existence. Like such a heavy term for like a credit card chip, you know, it's so incredible. But it was really, she was so, so well conceived. There was just, and there is so much freedom on the set that it, everything does feel really alive and captured and so you don't have to worry about like, are you, you know, I, I hate on movie sets when people are like, where are you, are you here, are you? I, I just, I can't bear it. So on this, it's like there was nobody ever asked that question because it just would never ever come up, you know? It's just things are gonna get captured and you were just, just be alive and free and do it, and, and so it was really, yeah, I can't compare it to anything I've done before. Rob, what about you? I mean, that's a pretty good answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it there. Uh, Ditto. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, kind of, the only thing really is just, in, like, in terms of, well, no, 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 that's a perfect answer. I'm not going to mess it up. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> Uh, um, guys, I, I love the film so much. Congratulations. Uh, it opens this weekend, right? This yeah. Friday? Yeah. Uh, it starts sneak peeking tonight at Thursday night. So, so it's Thursday. So if you want a sneak peek tonight, go for the sneak peek. Well, no, you yeah. go. It's playing in theaters. It opens oh, okay. tonight, basically, late night. So there, you can go and see it tonight. And, uh, and then it opens tomorrow. Is yeah, it and we're doing some uh, nationwide on the 25th. Nationwide. And we're doing some Q and A's in New York uh, tomorrow. It'll be it's, and Saturday. It's, it's New York and LA this Friday, and then it Correct. goes on the 18th. There's some more cities, and then it'll just kind of. 
It's a movie that you have to see in the theater. It's going to blow your mind. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here. Thank you, everyone.